Run right up your engine! John Pino asks, Scotty, a friend of mine's looking at my brand new car. He's undecided between the 2020 Corolla sedan and the 2020 Honda Civic. Which one would you recommend? Here's the problem. You're talking about two new cars. You never know what a new car is going to be like till it's been out a while. I can't forecast the future. But from the past, I would go for the Corolla, and here's why. My son a couple years ago bought a 2018 Corolla, and he loves it. It's got the CVT transmission, which he didn't like the idea of, but he likes driving it now because he says it accelerates fine and gets really good gas mod. Out of the CVTs out there, it makes some of the best ones. Honda, on the other hand, their CVTs are a little bit on the weak side. So just from past performances, I'd say get the 2020 Corolla sedan. They had problems with the Toyota Corolla hatchback, only the hatchback. They had problems with the CVT transmissions going out on that, so I would not buy the hatchback version of it. But they're both very good cars. It's just that the Corolla generally has a more reliable automatic transmission. Now, if you're going for a standard transmission, get whatever you want. It's not going to make any difference. The Hondas make great ones with standard transmission. So does Toyota. So that, a lot of guys will go Civic standard because they're a little bit zippier if you want a little more speed. Martin 19. 1971 says Scotty I bought a junk Chevy Avio 1.506 with 245,000 kilometers I changed a lot of stuff now it uses oil three liters a month car doesn't smoke I can't see where it goes and it runs rich I assume there's bovine the pistons should I fix it or sell it as is help sell it <laughs> Veos, whatever you want to call them, are pieces of junk. Obviously, the engine's worn out. When the engines go out on those, they're not worth the money you'd have to put into them. You're better. Just get rid of that thing. Get uh, an old Honda Civic. Drive that around with lower mileage than that. Don't put any more money into that. Those are, those are terrible cars. I've had customers with them. I mean, they're just so poorly made that even if you just bump into a curb a little bit, it'll bend the lower control arm because they're made so cheap and thin. Definitely get rid of that. You know, get yourself a Civic. They're well made and they can last hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles. Not just kilometers, but miles. Twice as much almost. Carter Tool says, Scotty, I got a 2016 half ton Silverado. Five 5.3 six-speed automatic. I bought the truck with $38,000. I'm pretty particular. And the transmission started acting up, making noise. So I took it in under warranty, and they said they put in a torque converter, TCM, valve body, and a fluid flush, because it was under warranty. So now it has 46,000 miles, and it's doing the same thing. Now they say they can't find anything wrong. If you would have asked me earlier, I would have said, don't buy that Silverado. Their transmissions aren't that good anymore. It's a 2016. The those are just weak transmissions. They probably screwed you over with the warranty work. I doubt if they did all the stuff that they said they did. I'm sure you didn't see the transmission pulled off, the parts put in, but you know, you're getting the same problem you had before that they fixed under warranty. They just don't want to do the job over, so they're just going to say there's nothing wrong with it. You know, if I were you, I would film it when it's doing it. Show them the actual footage and say, it's doing it, don't give me any BS. Give me a loaner car, call me back when it's fixed and see what happens. I mean, a lot of times you got to hit these guys over the head, sledgehammer, before they'll do anything when they're not making any money on the deal. Now, the first time, they should have fixed it correctly. Obviously, they did not. They just patched it up. They might even have just done a software update. I've seen them do that, and they'll pretend they did all this other work. If they do try to fix it this time, tell them when they pull the transmission off to work on it, you want to come in and see it. <laughs> so then you can see it with your own eyes, and I can't give you any baloney, because over the years, I've had people bring me vehicles that suppose they had a bunch of work, and when I took it all apart, I found out the stuff never been taken apart before, that they were just lied to totally. And I'm kind of guessing they lied to you, and they probably just reprogrammed the software to make it shift a little bit better, and that only lasts a short time generally, and then the problem comes back. I see that all the time. Whenever these manufacturers say, oh, there's a software fix for your transmission problem, odds are it's not going to last very long and sometimes it doesn't even work perfectly when you get it back from that right away it might be a little better but it still isn't right because it's just a software fix that really is trying to fix an underlying hardware fix of a problem inside the transmission. Daihatsu dude says, Scotty, did Chrysler make any reliable vehicles for the U.S. market during the 1980s? Well, you know, that's when they had those ugly, horrendous K cars. And yeah, the quality wasn't that good. You know, they hired Lee Iacocca to bring the back the idea of better Chryslers. And that's basically what Lee Iacocca did. He brought back ideas. It was a lot of talk. It was a lot of hoopla. They still made 
crap. I was just talking to a guy who, as a matter of fact, worked in the Chrysler factories back then. He's retired now. And he told me, oh, Scott, he said, you watch one of my videos about Lee Iacocca. He says, you're right about Lee. They said what a hero the guy was. He screwed us workers over to the wall, tried to pay us less and less and less, and was buying inferior quality parts from all over the place to make the cars cheaper so they could have a higher profit. He built the cars, this guy, and even he said the quality of them was absolute crap. Now, that said, some of the newer ones are even crappier since Fiat took over Chrysler. And now, of course, a Fiat Chrysler merged with the French company Peugeot, and it's a 50-50 merger. They own half of each other, I guess, from what I read. The French aren't known for quality. The Italians aren't known for quality. Chrysler's not known for quality. So good luck with quality on Chrysler in the future. Maybe you'd want to go back into the 80s if you're buying one then. Get yourself a time machine. <laughs> but if you wanted a decent Chrysler, go back to the 60s and the early 70s. They made big monster cars, but they were pretty reliable, especially the Slant 6 and the nice V8 that they had. And those things were pretty well built way back in the day. Gosh, D says, Scotty, help me. My dad ran my 08 Santa Fe into some guy's staircase on the back of a truck, and a bunch of white steam hissed out. Now the AC doesn't blow cold, the compressor doesn't turn on. I think it punctured the little radiator thing on the front. Yeah, the little radiator thing in the front is called the AC condenser. Basically, it's an air conditioning radiator. It does the same thing the car radiator does. The car radiator dissipates engine heat from the engine coolant, and the condenser in front of it for the AC system, the AC condenser, dissipates heat from the air conditioning refrigerator going through the system, and yeah, he poked a hole in the thing. You gotta replace them. I've got a video on replacing an AC condenser on a car. You'll see how it's done. You can get aftermarket parts for those that cost a fraction of what the super expensive Korean car dealer sells them for. On something like that, I go locally to a chain here in town. Uh, it's called XL Parts it's in Houston. Say, can you get me a condenser for this? And they almost always can. And let's say the dealer one is $400. A lot of times I can get one for like $119 or $120. And yeah, they're made in China, but they're made out of aluminum. They always work pretty good. I, every time I bought the cheaper one, it worked perfectly fine. I had no problems with it. You can watch my video. It'll show how it's done. And if you don't have all the tools to evacuate it and fill up with refrigerant, you could do the whole job yourself and then take it to a mechanic and say, I had to replace the condenser. What do you charge? me to evacuate the system and then refill it with refrigerant and you know what that cost. Tommy Two Step Three says, got a 2012 Toyota Camry. My power windows stay on when the car's off and it's not the timer because I can come in an hour later and then they'll still work. Yeah, it's going to drain your battery because they got power the whole time, right? It's a very complicated system that goes from the switches, through wiring, through even the body control module. There is a relay for those power windows. And if that relay is shorted out, it'll do exactly that. So what I would tell you to do is, on Toyotas, a lot of the relays are the same. So go find where the power window relay is. Usually it's under the hood, sometimes under the dash. Find the power window relay. Take it out and look at it. Odds are, you somewhere in that car, you're going to have another relay that's exactly the same, has the same terminals on it. Plug that one out and plug it into the power window assembly. And if you see that they no longer stay on, Go buy another relay. It's that simple. Pray it's that simple. Because if it isn't, it could be the body control module. Could be an electrical wiring short. But from my experience, it's usually the body control module itself. Unless the car's been in a wreck, and then all bets are off, and there could be bent wires that have finally rubbed through the insulation and are shorting out somewhere, forcing it to stay on all the time. Jojo Net 3 says, Scotty, I got a 2008 Chevy Silverado. It's got that reduced engine power light on and has the code for the map sensor. So I replaced the map sensor, but it still isn't running right. What could be wrong? Just because the map light comes on, the code for the map sensor, it isn't always the map sensor itself. Something's wrong in a vacuum system, something's wrong in the wiring, something's wrong in the computer. But from my experience of those, if you use the good map sensor, don't go and buy the cheapest one you can get at any auto parts store. Buy one that's at least OEM made in the United States. If you did that, what you want to check is, the wiring connector where it plugs in because that's a fault on those GMs. Over time they rub and the stupid things get corroded. So let's say it's running rough and you grab that wiring harness and wiggle it where you plugged it in and it starts running differently. Replace that. You can buy the connector itself and then you splice the wiring on. It's a simple job. You just cut the wires, they're color coded, and then you splice them together and solder them with a soldering gun and put some of that heat shrink wrap on it, heat it up with a hair dryer so it shrinks down so water doesn't get in. Check the wiring first because if you did get a good map sensor, that's generally what goes wrong with those.
So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.